orthogonal polynomial, Ginebrin ensemble with finite point charge. Okay, hello. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, first I want to apologize. My voice today is very uh, bad, so I'm going to use this and talk very sil small voice. <clears throat> first I want to thank the organizer for uh, giving me the, uh, the chance to speak here. Uh, first time visiting Triste. And I want to speak about uh, planar orthogonal polynomial. Uh, let me, and this is the ongoing uh, project with uh, Meng Yang. <laughs> so let me first describe the model. So it's Coulomb gas. Um, the, the difference between uh, what uh, Professor Guillaume sp sp uh, taught us is that it's on the planar, it's on the full complex plane. So they repel with each other with beta equal one or two, depending on the uh, convention, and with some confining potential Q. Uh, this is the probability distribution for n point particles at the complex plane. And I'm going to use uh, Z, big Cn for the cap, uh, normalization constant uh, called partition function. And so partition function is one uh, interest uh, another thing of interest is the characteristic polynomial, which is just a uh, degree n polynomial whose zeros are at the Coulomb gas. So it's a random polynomial, because Coulomb gas uh, is random, dis randomly distributed according to this distribution. And if you take this random polynomial uh, average, then I get this uh, deterministic polynomial, and these are uh, objects of interest. These two objects, partition function, and this polynomial Pn in the large n limit, that's the interest of the talk. Okay, so I will use the specific uh, potential, not uh, general potential. <coughs> potential is uh, Gaussian. If, if I have only uh, this quadratic term, then it will be a Gini Brown ensemble where the particle is on the unit disk, uniformly distributed. But I will have L point fixed charge at the location A1, A2 to AL with the charge strength C1 to CL. So for example, in this picture, I fix three. I can even make it uh, move. Um, so these are uh, the blue dots are uh, Coulomb gas and I fixed three uh, point charge with different uh, strength. So this one I choose uh, charge four, this one charge two, and this one charge uh, 0 0.2 or something. And all the other are charge one. So you can see there's a, a little more distance from all the other charge because it has more repelling force. And actually charge can be slightly attractive also, like uh, charge can be any number uh, bigger than minus one. <coughs> and for this model, <laughs> we want to calculate the partition function, which is now explicitly written in this form. So for all the fixed charge, you also have the interaction term. Okay. And first, uh, <coughs> we, we will look at the polynomial the characteristic, average characteristic polynomial. So what is known is this average characteristic polynomial is also orthogonal polynomial, which satisfy this planar orthogonality with respect to the measure given by the same, uh, uh, same Q that defines uh, the probability distribution. So the same Q, this one. And the orthogonal polynomial uh, more explicitly can be written in this form. So that's, yes? Uh, how did I make this animation? Uh -huh. I, I just add Brownian noise. So this is the uh, cheating. 
because I don't know how much more noise I have to add to make the beta equal to. So this is for some unknown beta. Okay, so yeah. one, e uh, so uh, each particle is moved by uh, the force, deterministic force, plus Brownian noise. Deterministic force is from uh, the Gaussian and the force from all the other particles. Yeah. But this is a cheating, not beta equal to. C is not an integer. C can be any, any number larger than minus 1. Okay, so here is what is known so far about the asymptotics of the orthogonal polynomial. It's the message here is pretty less is known. For very uh, simple potential, they could obtain the location of the zeros uh, in the large and limit. Location of the zeros are usually uh, concentrated on some one-dimensional structure, even though the particles uh, are supported on two-dimensional uh, <coughs> support. So, uh, there are a few examples where this shaded part is where the Coulomb gas will stay, but the zeros of this average characteristic polynomial will stay on a, a one-dimensional uh, called skeleton of this domain. And most of the result is used uh, using uh, Riemann-Hilbert technique developed by uh, DKMVZ uh, and uh, only M is here in this uh, crowd, uh, McLaughlin. But the goal uh, is whether we can use this tool to, uh, which was so successful for uh, other uh, complex orthogonal polynomial, whether we can apply that same rule, same technique to planar orthogonal polynomial. And that's so far almost what we have uh, so far. Okay, and also there's a general result uh, given by Herenmam and when his student. Uh, this is the general asymptotics of the planar orthogonal polynomial for broad, broad class of Q. So here Q can be any smooth potential, but there's also some subtle assumption about uh, its uh, shape of the uh, equilibrium measure. But with subtle assumption, they obtain the asymptotics of the, uh, this uh, orthogonal polynomial. But here, the asymptotics is only in the domain which is outside the support of the Coulomb gas. So outside, the, in our case, it's outside the uh, unit disk. And all the zeros are some subset of some one-dimensional structure of the unit disk. So this doesn't tell you where, where the zeros are. So, so, Location of the zero still uh, unknown problem. Okay, so let me describe the answer. <coughs> answer for our my system. So first, uh, I will uh, define what is the Sego curve. Uh, Sego curve is the curve defined by this equation, very simple equation, and which is this closed curve the between yellow and uh, dark region. So this closed curve is the Sego curve. And that's actually the limiting zero uh, lo locus of this truncated and uh, little scaled uh, exponential function. So exponential function doesn't have zeros, but if you truncate the uh, exponential function, Taylor, Taylor series truncation, then it will have uh, zeros. And zero converges to the uh, Sego curve in the scaling limit. Okay, and I will uh, describe the result. Uh, when L equal 1, so if you have just single fixed point, if you just have single fixed point, then the zeros of the characteristic polynomial goes to this Sego curve. That's already uh, proven. <coughs> and, but, depend, but it's not uh, just the Sego curve. It can be just some generalized version of Sego curve, which I will describe soon. So depending on whether uh, this fixed charge is inside the disk or at the boundary of the disk or outside the disk, you will have different uh, shape of the Sego curve. Okay, so to describe the Sego curve for general case, I will uh, describe the Sego curve in a different language. 
So again, the same uh, equation for the Seiko curve. And this Seiko curve can be understood as the following. So first I draw uh, the, log, the graph of log of z absolute value as the yellow cone. That's the shape of the graph of log of z. And, and I draw the uh, graph of the other parts, uh, real part of a bar z. And that gives, of course, the plane. And where these two graph meet is where this equation is satisfied. So I draw this yellow cone plus this blue plane. And where it meets and this, those uh, 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 solution sets is where the Segal curve. So here, uh, this uh, white line is the Segal curve. And the right hand side is uh, if I take only, so at every point, if I take the maximal uh, uh, value of the two graph, then I obtain this right hand side. So that's the maximal between this two yellow part and the blue plane. And actually that's uh, uh, exactly the log of the uh, polynomial in the limit. That's the result from uh, when there's only one fixed point. Okay, now I described uh, when there's a finite number of fixed points, so here I will describe multiple Segal curve. <coughs> so multiple Segal curve is the same. We consider log of z, uh, the, the, the previous cone-shaped yellow curve. And then we consider many planes. And for each plane coming from uh, all uh, new addition of the fixed point. So fixed point A1 gives uh, the plane, which is directed in the A1 direction, another plane, uh, A2. So there's L planes if you add uh, L fixed points. And you draw all the planes and all the cones, and you uh, look at the graph of the maximum. Then you see this kind of uh, graph, which is for three fixed points. So here the red dots are the location of the fixed points. I call the maximal function, the, which is represented by this graph, capital Phi. And I just define the, each region where the jth plane is dominating is omega j, for example, here. And I also note that each plane can move up or down by the level, uh, which I denote by L, Lj, if you we increase LJ, then plane goes up, LJ down, place goes down. And you have to match this height such that the plane is exactly uh, intersecting this log of Z, other plane, other uh, graph, at the location of this AJ, the point. So once you match the height such that the point, uh, the fixed uh, location of the fixed point is at the boundary, exactly at the boundary, then that determines the height LJ. And it's not uh, very trivial, but you can show that given AJs, such multiple Segal uh, curve is unique. So all the L LJs, the height, is chosen uniquely. Uh, it, uh, here I try to sh show how this lemma can be proven. First, uh, you choose one plane until uh, A1 is at the boundary and then move the second plane until A2 is at the boundary. Actually this point can be uh, at the boundary between the two plane also. So whenever two plane meets, the boundary is the straight line. So you see many straight lines and AJs can be in the straight line. So such curve is unique and the theorem goes as the same as in the uh, for just one fixed point case. So this maximal function that I showed in this graph here gives uh, the asymptotics of the polynomial. And actually Riemann-Hilbert problem is uh, always uh, overkill. It gives the, ah, so this is the demonstration of the result. So here you cannot actually see this uh, uh, line but there's a white line between all the intersection uh, of the uh, planar graphs. And the 
location of the zeros are exactly matching on the uh, intersecting lines, so it shows that the result is actually very good. These red dots are the location of the fixed points. <coughs> actually, one can put the red dots also outside. Then, uh, yes, question? Uh, computing the zeros, I have to uh, go through the Riemann Hilbert problem. Yeah. And I need a lot of mathematics. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, no, away from the, away from the loc zero locus. But as Riemann Hilbert problem always does, it gives stronger result everywhere, yes. Also, uh, as common in Riemann-Hilbert problem, you need a special uh, asymptotics. So you have asymptotic, different form of asymptotics outside, inside, or on the uh, locus of the zeros. And you need special asymptotics called local parametrics near each uh, fixed point, each fixed charge. And if you zoom in those fixed charge, then it's given by also truncated exponential function, but it's uh, the other way. It's, uh, f it's subtracting the finite truncation, and the other uh, yeah, part gives the local behavior of the zeros. Uh, actually, this is only for uh, integer c, but if it is not integer, then it's uh, replaced by some integral. Okay. <laughs> So I will explain how I obtained this in a very crude way. Uh, I don't want to go to the detail. <coughs> so I will define the multiple orthogonal polynomial as exactly defined by uh, Silva. <coughs> so multiple orthogonal polynomial is uh, instead of uh, just one measure, you have multiple measure to define orthogonal polynomial. So P, uh, multiple orthogonal polynomial is defined by index n1, n2, and l, not just one degree, but uh, so, so that uh, their sum becomes the degree of the polynomial. And it requires uh, l measure. So first measure, mu1, uh, gives uh, l n1 orthogonality. The second measure gives n2 orthogonality. So in total, they give exactly n orthogonality that can dis uh, define the n degree, poly degree n polynomial uniquely. And this is the measure uh, of this multiple orthogonality, uh, which is given by some crazy uh, integral. Uh, so I said uh, L different measures, so difference is coming from this blue index. So if, uh, no, no, ignore the blue index. Blue index ignore, just uh, red index. So if K different, then one of the power in the integrand changes. So sometimes you subtract one of the power, then that gives L, L different measures. So they are very quite close to each other. And all in, so L different measure is in my problem, it's all living in the same contour. The contour is uh, actually here. Contour is from uh, going around each fixed point, each fixed charge uh, once, while rotating the origin ones. You can always uh, arrange the contour in such way. So that's my definition of the orthogonal polynomial. And what we proved uh, is that our planar orthogonal polynomial is actually same as the multiple orthogonal polynomial for such choice of index. So if I give uh, degree uh, 100 and 10 uh, fixed charge, then I div divide the 100 into most uniform uh, way into 10 uh, uh, decomposition. So 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. Uh, so th for such index, you define the multiple orthogonal polynomial with the previous measure. Then it gives exactly the planar orthogonal polynomial. So having such multiple orthogonal polynomial, then we have uh, immediately the Riemann-Hilbert problem, uh, which is uh, the matrix Riemann-Hilbert problem of size L plus 1 by L plus 1. So if you have additional charge, the size of the Riemann-Hilbert problem increases. And 
this is the corresponding uh, jump condition and uh, boundary condition. And the rest is the st same st uh, steepest descent analysis developed by DKMVC. So I will just describe very quickly. So we want uh, approximate solutions to the exact solution, which is unknown. The exact solution is unknown, but we want approximate solution. To find the approximate solution, instead of looking at the, trying to find the solution, we look at the, uh, I mean, uh, we look at the Riemann-Hilbert problem, exact Riemann-Hilbert problem, and compare it with the approximate Riemann-Hilbert problem that can be easily obtained from the approximate solution. And uh, the theorem is uh, the exact solution, the distance from the exact solution to the approximate solution is given by the distance of the problem, distance between the Riemann-Hilbert problem, exact Riemann-Hilbert problem to the approximate Riemann-Hilbert problem. So if you can show that these two Riemann-Hilbert problems is close, then we can prove that this approximate solution is also close. So that's the main uh, strategy of using Riemann-Hilbert problem. But there's other benefit. Uh, first, the Riemann-Hilbert problem can give you uh, 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 lax pair, and it also it can give, therefore, recurrence relation. And that's how I obtain, actually, the numerical calculation, the zeros of the polynomial, because uh, Finding zeros by Gram Schmidt is, I believe, it's impossible because there are many moments with exponentially small contribution, which actually uh, very uh, the zeros are very sensitive to ex exponentially small quantity, and without uh, this recurrence relation, it's impossible to plot the zeros. And the second thing is the partition function, which I will explain uh, now. So, partition function is related to the moment determinant of this multiple orthogonal polynomial system. Okay, so this is more uh, thing about the uh, Riemann-Hilbert problem side. <coughs> so I said that the multiple orthogonal polynomial is supported on the contour that goes through all the A1 to A2, A3, A, uh, A, the, all the fixed point. But some of the fixed point is actually inside the multiple stego curve. So first you uh, fix the contour to go around on the most outer boundary of the multiple stego curve. But whenever the fixed point is inside, you have to come back and go out following this branch cut because there's a, uh, because all this charge strength CJ is not equal to I, uh, integer, then there's a nasty branch cut and that actually gave uh, me so much headache uh, by the way, this talk has been, similar talk has been given uh, a few uh, months ago, and there's some people in the audience I'm apologizing. Um. <laughs> okay. Uh. So at, at the time, uh, um, at the time, it's a few months ago, uh, for non-integer C was still not completely uh, proven, but I thought it's a small hurdle, but it took, uh, took much more than that. So now non-integer uh, C can also be handled. And so that's how you uh, draw the contour. So you have the contour that goes around the branch cut coming from the non-integer C. Uh, okay. Okay, so some proof that I really worked. And you have to write many notation with the general size matrix because it's uh, for arbitrary size uh, L, L plus one by L plus one. So you have to uh, use some crazy notation. Okay, now partition function. So uh, we are interested in the partition function because we are actually interested in the moments of the characteristic polynomial, which has been uh, uh, appeared in other uh, talks. So Moments of the so I, I remind you the characteristic polynomial is chi is the polynomial that has uh, zeros at the Coulomb gas. And if I take the absolute value and uh, <coughs> take the power by C1, then it becomes uh, the moment. And I can add multiple uh, moments of the character 
characteristic polynomial, so we want to calculate this expectation value of the moments of the characteristic, uh, the moments of the characteristic polynomial. So why do we look at this quantity? So if physically, that's uh, the following. So if we have a fi L fixed charge with certain charge, then of course each charge fi uh, feels some force, electric force coming from the external source and also between each other. But question is, what if you throw in uh, this background Coulomb gas? What will be the force? Well, how, how the force of this fixed charge change? And the answer to that is, uh, answer to that is, uh, after this background charge is added, they don't feel the force from each other. So the background electric uh, electrons will completely screen the electric field between uh, each other, so they don't feel any electric uh, field. And that's uh, exactly the statement of this conjecture by uh, Webb and Wang. <coughs> And there's more exciting recent uh, result. Uh, so Weber and Wang actually, when they make this conjecture, they proved uh, this uh, for formula for single charge L equal one. And further, uh, so this is the case when uh, the fixed charge is inside the bulk, but when the fixed charge is near the boundary of this uh, unit disk, then there's a special function, pi naive four appears, and this is, I think, basically uh, given by this uh, uh, paper, but for some slightly uh, yeah, different model, which is actually equivalent. And then a month, less than a month ago, there's another few, few weeks ago, uh, there's another paper who proved this uh, conjecture for <coughs> L equal two. Uh, th uh, they used, uh, uh, okay, so their, their method is different, so they can only do uh, see this strength to be integer. So that's good, because I can still contribute. So they can do uh, uh, strength integer. Actually, after they can also make one of them non-integer. So C1 integer, then C2 non-integer, then they can prove this uh, fact for two uh, fixed point. So this is the plot of actually the correlation uh, to fixed points. So when we have uh, two fixed points, the moment uh, can be plotted for different uh, number of background Coulomb gas, and it converges to this, uh, this uh, the, the top line is the theoretical line, and this uh, color line is converging to the top line. And of course, the top line diverges when the two charges meet. But uh, what they did is, uh, when they are very close, they can see a more fine structure of the Coulomb gas, uh, and it's regularized by Pagneve 5. So this regularization is described in, this, uh, in their paper. Okay, uh, 12, 11. So I will describe how, how we can also study these uh, moments of the characteristic polynomial. And a little bit of result, because this is ongoing work. So first, uh, the solvability of the Riemann-Hilbert problem, because Riemann-Hilbert problem is uh, related to the multiple orthogonal polynomial, it's related to the unique existence of the multiple orthogonal polynomial. Whenever there's a orthogonal polynomial, the existence is related to the non-vanishing determinant of its moment. So moment determinant, non-vanishing, then multi some orthogonal polynomial exists. So in this case also, there's a moment determinant corresponding to the multiple orthogonal polynomial. So since there's many, many uh, measure, for each measure, you write down the moment matrix rectangular matrix of some size, and you, if you combine it for each uh, measure, then you will get the moment matrix of uh, n by n, the degree of the multiple orthogonal polynomial. And if that uh, determinant of that matrix is <coughs> non-vanishing, 
then it's equivalent to having unique multiple orthogonal polynomial, and it's also equivalent to uh, the solvability of the Riemann-Hilbert problem. Okay. Also, in another context, solvability of Riemann-Hilbert problem is known to be related to so-called tau function. And tau function is given any Riemann-Hilbert problem or given uh, matrix uh, ODE system like here, then there's an associated tau function. Tau function is defined by uh, one, of, one of the tau called Jimbo Miwa when a tau function is defined this way. Also, uh, there's other definition. So the property of the tau function is the non-vanishing tau, tau function means the solvability of the corresponding Riemann-Hilbert problem. So in our case, we have the Riemann-Hilbert problem for Yn, and we can uh, make the lax pair system or linear ODE by multiplying some deterministic matrix B which I show, for example, here. <clears throat> and once you do that, you can find all the quantities to dis define the tau function. Actually, this is a uh, uh, variation of the tau function. Tau function is defined up to a uh, constant uh, with respect to the variation of the, uh, the parameters in the problem. So tau, you can find the tau variance variation if you know the solutions to the Riemann-Hilbert problem. So if you have the asymptotic solution, then you have the asymptotic behavior of the tau function. And what is known is that this tau function is equivalent to the moment determinant. Because both, so the right-hand side tau function is telling you the solvability of Riemann-Hilbert problem. The left-hand side is showing you the uh, unique existence of the orthogonal polynomial. So they must be related, but they are actually the same. And that's shown, uh, uh, for example, by Bertola. And here's the main idea how to uh, show them. Uh, so whenever, OK, so instead of uh, showing that, yeah, so it's shown by induction by looking at the tau quotient. So tau n divided by tau 1 less is equivalent to this um, <coughs> ratio between the moment determinant and you can easily show that tau at n equals 0 is equivalent to the moment determinant at n equals 0, and that shows the equivalence. And therefore, now uh, we have the tool to calculate the moment determinant. And moment determinant is actually equivalent, uh, not equivalent, but uh, related to the partition function by some uh, crazy relation, uh, which come out of nowhere. I, I don't have good explanation. <clears throat> and from that, we can calculate the variation of the partition function, which uh, can be obtained uh, with a quick uh, calculation using the asymptotics we have to be uh, this. And once we uh, integrate, uh, then we have the antiderivative up to constant, the partition function is behaving as the conjecture uh, says for arbitrary number of L and for arbitrary set of CJs. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so my, my uh, work is too, too little to fill the whole 45 minutes, so it's uh, finished, but uh, since I have too many, too many times, I will say one more possible future work. This is not uh, work done, but just... So if we have uh, two fixed point, and the fixed point was of the sa have the same strength, similar order strength as all the other Coulomb gas, but if we make this strength uh, much bigger than the other Coulomb particle, then you can actually change the droplet. The support of the Coulomb gas can drastically change. So it's no longer unit disk, and in such case, uh, such uh, domain becomes some um, special domain, sometimes called uh, quadrature domain. 
and the location of the zeros is uh, then uh, conjectured to be the mother body of such, such domains. So those can also be studied uh, using the formulation in terms of the Riemann-Hilbert problem in the future. And that's, that's all. Yeah, thank you.